The following episode contains some strong language and may not be suitable for everyone. Please be advised. So, Matt, one of the things about this story that just blows my mind is that essentially the only thing bonding these two people together is a secret and dirt, you know, gossip on the other person. Yeah, surely any friendship, even a professional working relationship, needs to have more to it than that. Surely. Just while we're on that, um, you know I told you, and I sort of shouldn't have, but about that incident with the park ranger. That's, you know, need to know basis, isn't it? As disgusting as it is, it is just between you yeah. and okay. Don't worry about yeah, it. Good. And um, just on the, on the same thing, that whole bouncy castle business. Oh, my God. Yeah, I couldn't sleep for weeks thinking about that. Mm. But no one was actually, I mean, they weren't hurt, were they? That's irrelevant. You just haven't told anyone, have you? No, got all lips <laughs> Um And just like, while we're riffing and catching up, you know my recurring um, ailment? That's a sort of doctor-patient, podcaster-podcaster, confidentiality thing, isn't it? Oh, yes, don't worry. That is, that is locked away securely in the vault. Oh, phew, thank you. Of my public social media profiles. 23rd of October, 1975, Exmoor. On his knees on the soaking wet ground, Norman cradles Rinker's lifeless body on his lap. Then he raises his gaze to the man who's standing over him, holding a gun to his head. Norman squeezes his eyes shut and prepares to die. Ah, shit! Norman opens his eyes. The gunman carries on cursing, then lifts the revolver from the side of Norman's head and examines it. There's something wrong. Norman scrambles to his feet, heart pounding in his chest. He races away from the car and into the moors. The heavy mist swirls around him, making it near impossible to see. The driving rain lashes his face. He doesn't know where he's going. All he knows is that he has to get as far away from the road as possible. But as the fear and adrenaline start to leave his body, Norman slows down, then stops. He can just about make out the lights of Cardiff twinkling in the distance. Norman is instantly hit by the reality of his situation. He's on a freezing moor in the middle of nowhere. He's already soaked to the skin. He won't last a night out here. Norman slumps onto the muddy grass. He starts to cry. But soon, as he wipes away the tears, he's overtaken by a feeling of peace. Maybe this was destined to be. After all, he's looked for a way out of his pain so many times before. All he had was Rinka, and now she's gone. Perhaps he should embrace this, join her. So what if it means Thorpe's won? Norman never really stood a chance against him anyway. Norman picks himself up. If this is his time, so be it. But he wants to be with his beloved dog. He starts running back to the car, gathering pace with every step. By the time he reaches the road, his breath is laboured, his legs close to buckling beneath him. He sees the gunman's silhouette in the headlights, hands still clutching the revolver. But Norman isn't scared anymore. He's ready. Norman walks towards Rinker's body, He raises his hands. The gunman looks confused. Norman realises he'll have to spell it out. Go on, then. Do it. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. So, Matt, last episode, we were introduced to the relationship between Norman Joseph and Jeremy Thorpe. And it's, to say the least, a very complex dynamic to get your head around. Yes, it is. Norman really is a tragic character and it's hard not to feel really sorry for him because he's just wholly reliant on the kindness and generosity of older men and not just their kindness and generosity, but he's also subject to their whims and ends up doing jobs for them, really, that he shouldn't be doing, like shaving that guy's back. Oh, please don't remind me. And also, please 
stop asking me to do it. With a pulse fit that I can't reach. But it seemed that maybe the relationship with Thorpe was different and we all hoped it would be. And Thorpe seemed to offer him a sense of stability and security. But even at its most secure moments, it still felt quite precarious. Yeah, the word you keep thinking about is agency and how these power dynamics work and who has the power to make genuine choices, particularly with the added complication of Norman's mental health, which seems to be the thing that ultimately causes Thorpe to end the relationship. Yes, and speaking of that agency, we saw Norman trying to take it back at the end of the last episode and you left us with this amazing cliffhanger where he'd just gone into the police station to tell them about his relationship with Thorpe. The problem is, knowing what the police were like back then and how the establishment behaved, I do wonder if they're going to actually believe him. What truth is and who dictates it are both things that will come into question in this part of the story. This is episode two, The Go-Between. October 1964, Chelsea Police Station, London. Norman fidgets in his seat as he looks around the small grey interview room. The detective opposite leans back, folds his arms and waits. Norman doesn't know what else he's expected to say. As I've told you several times... I felt compelled to report my homosexual relationship with Jeremy Thorpe because it's caused me so much purgatory. I'm I'm afraid it might happen to somebody else. The officer drums his fingers on the desk, clearly unsure what to do next. Norman looks at him in frustration. He's already spoken to the police in Dublin, who told him he needs to speak to the Met. So here he is, sat at a table strewn with the love letters he brought as evidence. The officer has read them, but still seems unable, or unwilling, to believe the pair were lovers. Do you realise the seriousness of these accusations, Mr Joseph? Exasperated, Norman picks up one of the letters, starts reading aloud. My angel, all I want is to share a Devon farm with you. I cannot wait to kiss you again, to be naked next to you, to be inside you. Imagine your love letters got read out in a police station. I don't want to think about that. I guess it'd be WhatsApps these days, wouldn't it? Oh, can you imagine? The horror. The officer shuffles uncomfortably. Norman is determined to drive the point home. He's talking about anal sex, buggery. He didn't always use a lubricant. Sometimes it was very painful. That's enough. The officer slams out of the room. Norman finds his mind wandering to what will become of Thorpe when this gets out. His initial motive for reporting him was revenge. But now he's calmer. He just wants Thorpe to face up to what he's done. Acknowledge how their affair has left him with no home and no prospect of getting paid employment. But he feels sick at the thought of having to make a public statement. Testify in court, even. Homosexual acts are illegal, after all. It's not only Thorpe who could face a prison term. Norman could, too. He catches the eye of the PC in the corner who glares at him with disgust. Norman is gripped by a familiar feeling of shame. He doesn't want this to turn into a witch hunt. For him, or for Thorpe. The officer re-enters the room. Thank you for coming in today, Mr Joseph. We'll be taking no further action at this time. Norman can only stare at him, stunned. The officer picks his letters up. We'll need to keep these for evidence. What? Why? I I don't understand. The officer moves closer to Norman. He lowers his voice. If you know what's good for you, you'll get yourself back to Dublin. Forget about this whole sordid business. Norman is frog-marched out of the station and practically thrown onto the street. He's in the middle of his old neighbourhood, surrounded by wealth. But this time, there'll be no fancy lunches, no pricey suit fittings. He can't even claim benefits without the national insurance card Thorpe failed to arrange for him. Norman feels the familiar sense of injustice return. He decides that if the authorities won't help him, he's going to contact the one person he knows will make Jeremy Thorpe listen. November 1964, Westminster. In his office... Thorpe feels bile rise from the pit of his stomach as his mother reads a passage from the 17-page letter she's holding. It gives me no pleasure to tell you that our first sexual acts took place in the bedroom next to your own. 
From that night, we spent many months together as lovers. Your son promised he would look after me. He has reneged on this promise. She trains her eyes on Thorpe, awaiting an explanation. His heart thuds in his chest. He feels ambushed. He should have known a boy as emotionally fragile as Norman wouldn't go away quietly. But he never thought he'd write to his mother. Thorpe knows stalling for too long will only make him look more guilty. He takes a gamble, forces out a belly laugh. How utterly preposterous! I barely know the man. Ursula's eyes remain fixed on her son. His heartbeat quickens again. The thought of his mother knowing this side of his life horrifies him. He snatches the pages from her grasp. He has to know what Norman's told her if he has any chance of refuting it convincingly. To his relief, there doesn't seem to be any graphic description of the sex that took place in her home or Norman's bedsit. But he needs to leave no room for doubt. He spots a plea by Norman for a loan of £30. Look, the man's begging for money. He's clearly on the make. Thorpe again feels the weight of her intense stare upon him. Finally, she speaks. Yes, he sounds deranged. I sensed he wasn't all there when we met. The tension leaves Thorpe's body. He's not certain his mother is convinced, but it's clear she has no desire to probe further. That's good enough for him. But he needs to deal with Norman, and fast. He can't risk him talking to someone more public. I'll pay him a visit, give him his blessed 30 pounds, and remind him that if he does this sort of thing again, I won't hesitate in reporting him to the authorities. Ursula looks horrified. Don't be a bloody fool. Any contact will simply fan the flames of gossip and any money you give him will make you look guilty. You must find another way. With a brisk kiss on the cheek, his mother leaves him with the letter. She's right. What he needs is a go-between. Someone who can stretch the truth. Someone with a few secrets of their own that Thorpe can exploit as leverage to keep them on side. Someone ruthless. He needs another MP, and he has just the man in mind. December 1964, the Ritz Hotel, London. Peter Bessel throws his head back and laughs uproariously. He can't remember when he last had such a fun evening. He's at one of the dining room's best tables, overlooking Green Park, with the Liberal Party's biggest rising star, Jeremy Thorpe. He's been so busy listening to Thorpe's outrageous stories, he's barely touched his steak tartare. I would never do that. Straight into the food, immediately, no matter who I'm with. I bet you wouldn't be ordering a steak tartare, though. I bet you don't approve of that. Do you know what? Because it's posh, I've slightly convinced myself that it must be good. (laughs) I'm so gullible. Is it rank? It does look like it should be eaten out of a bowl at floor level. (laughs) By a dog. Yeah. Or a bodybuilder. It seems like something that a bodybuilder would eat every two hours. Not someone of my physique. That's not what I was suggesting. Not for chubby lads, is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that, okay? I'm just saying a fish in a rice cake won't kill you. (laughs) Thorpe clicks his fingers to summon the waiter. He orders another bottle of Bollinger, then leans in conspiratorially. Tell me, Peter, is it true you bedded that delightful secretary of yours? Diana, is it? Bessel is taken aback by Thorpe's directness. With his gravelly voice and a passing resemblance to Humphrey Bogart, Bessel has found it easy to conduct many such indiscretions. But as a married man, he rarely admits to them. Under Thorpe's inquisitive glare, however, he can't help but open up. Let's just say it's not only her typing that's good. Thorpe chuckles and Bessel finds himself blushing with pride. Just months into his role as the new MP for Bodmin in Cornwall, he's made few friends in the Commons. He'd assumed Thorpe asked him here as a matter of routine, to court his vote for any future leadership contest. But all he's done so far is tell jokes and exchange tittle-tattle. So, Jeremy, have you sampled the delights of the Westminster secretarial pool? This is exactly how you imagine rotters to talk. Sampled the delights. Like it's a tray of truffles. 
Chocolate or just large, strong smelling <laughs> fungi? Oh, I was thinking of chocolate. I thought so. Yeah, because I'm basic. <laughs> Imagine me at the Ritz. I'm sorry, the truffle soup doesn't taste of <laughs> chocolate. I don't know if your guys made a mistake or something. My truffle linguine uh, is a little lacking in the old cocoa, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Thorpe's expression changes. He suddenly looks guarded and a little embarrassed. Bessel could kick himself. Has he gone too far? Some MPs fiercely protect their private lives, however much they enjoy discussing the antics of others. To Bessel's relief, Thorpe gives a weak smile, signalling he's not offended. I would like to share more, Peter, but I worry you would be shocked. Bessel looks Thorpe in the eye, at pains to reassure him. Come now, none of us live like Trappist monks. Considering how I conduct my own affairs, I make a point of not judging others. Thorpe hesitates, then leans in again. He looks deadly serious. Let's just say I'm not a ladies' man like you. I have certain tendencies. Bessel immediately realises what Thorpe is saying. He's never had an issue with what anyone else does. I wouldn't have thought people would mind these days. You know there are MPs trying to get a bill through Parliament to legalise all that. Thorpe's expression darkens. This is the most serious Bessel's seen him all night. It doesn't matter. I would never be able to lead the party if it came out. Bessel knows Thorpe is right. While he considers himself a man of the world, many so-called liberals are still stuck in the Dark Ages. Thorpe goes on. To be honest, it's been, well, quite a worry lately. Thorpe trails off. His mood seems to have shifted. Bessel can't leave it there. How so? Thorpe stays tight-lipped. Jeremy, after all I've told you tonight, you must know you can trust me. Thorpe pauses again, then nods. He takes a letter out of his jacket pocket. Bessel listens intently, as Thorpe explains it was written to his mother by a young man who's trying to blackmail him after a brief liaison. Thorpe despairs at his predicament. Bessel senses an opportunity. Thorpe is often talked about as party leader in waiting. He could be just the ally Bessel needs to further his own parliamentary career. Why don't I speak to this boy for you? See what I can do. Thorpe looks overwhelmed with gratitude. Bessel finally tucks into his steak tartare, ravenous. Opportunities like this don't come along every day. He's going to grab this one with both hands. Tomorrow, he's going to fly to Dublin and prove just how useful to Thorpe he can be. Two days later, December 1964, Dublin. In the back of a taxi, Bessel checks his watch yet again, looks at the meter as the fare clicks up. Norman Joseph has been giving him the runaround since he arrived in Dublin last night, failing to meet him on two occasions. With Bessel's flight home due to leave in a couple of hours, he's now arranged to pick him up from the hostel he's staying in so they can talk on the way to the airport. Still eyeing his watch, Bessel sighs deeply. At this rate, his friendship with Thorpe will be over before it's begun. But to his relief, a scruffy, slightly breathless young man opens the door and slides into the seat next to him. I'm so sorry, Mr. Bessel. Timekeeping isn't my strong point. Bessel gives Norman the once over. He's undeniably handsome, in a grubby sort of way. The weather outside is mild, but Norman is visibly shaking. Bessel figures scaring him should be easy. He instructs the cab driver to get going, fixes Norman with a hard stare. As I said on the phone, Norman, I'm here on behalf of JT. You mean Jeremy Thorpe? Bessel eyes the driver in the rearview mirror, concerned about privacy. He doesn't have time to play games. He returns his gaze to Norman, adopts a sterner tone. Let me put this in terms. You'll understand, young man. JT is very disappointed you felt the need to write a frankly defamatory letter to his mother. It's nothing short of a blackmail attempt. I have an extradition order signed by the Home Secretary in my pocket. 
If I do not get your assurance that you'll have no further contact with JT's mother or any other associate of JT's, I will have you sent back to Britain to stand trial. Show it to me. What? The extradition order, in your pocket. Show me. Bessel's thrown, panicked even. There is no extradition order. Oh, no, that's a receipt from the dry cleaners. I, I must be mad, the jacket. I usually don't wear this jacket for work, so it doesn't matter. I'll just tell you what it says. Oh, he's been completely outmaneuvered so early in this exchange. I love that there's no contingency plan either. He's just like, if he accepts it, great. If he doesn't, jump out of the moving car. All I asked for was a loan of £30. I said in the letter I'd pay it back. That isn't blackmail. But if you want to take me to court, that's fine. At least then, I could tell my story. The taxi driver must be loving this. <laughs> I'll be going the long way around just to get the full scoop. Bessel realises he's misjudged Norman. He clearly has nothing to lose. Bessel can't leave empty-handed. What is it you want, Mr Joseph? A national insurance card, so I can work. I don't want handouts. The cab pulls up outside Dublin Airport. Bessel pays the fare and hands Norman some money and his card with his address. He softens his tone. I'll get JT to sort that out for you. And I'm sorry we got off on the wrong foot. But from now on, you must keep all contact through me, OK? Norman nods. Striding away from the taxi, Bessel's pleased with himself. Norman winds the window down, calls back to him. Mr. Bessel, I truly am so sorry for writing to Mrs. Thorpe. I really did care for Jeremy JT. I feel so awful. Oh, and, and, and there is something else that you should know. Some of the letters Jeremy wrote to me, they're with the police. Bessel stops in his tracks, feels the colour drain from his face. The police? Bessel looks at Norman in disbelief feels blood rushing to his head. His legs feel as heavy as lead. He needs to get back to London. He needs to tell Thorpe. He has no choice but to go higher up for help. They need to use the power of the establishment. December 1964. The Home Office, London. Thorpe tries to stay composed as the Labour Home Secretary, Frank Soskis, lights his pipe, sits back in his chair and ponders what he's just been told. Thorpe has rarely felt so uncomfortable. Not only has he been forced to seek help from a member of an opposing party, but at over 60 years old, Soskis is an entirely different generation. Thorpe suspects he must have found what he's heard abhorrent. Well, Jeremy, this is truly a ghastly situation. Thorpe arranged this meeting on Bessel's advice, in the hope of regaining some control. He's just spun Soskis the same story he told his mother. But this time, Thorpe's had to add that Norman has told the police a pack of lies too. Even he can see that he's asking a lot of the Home Secretary. If he's called it wrong, his career is likely finished. This says a lot about the establishment at the time because... Whatever you think of our politics now, the thought that an MP from a different party would go to the Home Secretary (laughs) with all the political advantage that that person could exercise over you and actually calculate that because they're all part of, in a way, the same club, that there's a strong likelihood the Home Secretary will help him is incredible when you think of how polarised politics has become now. Thorpe watches as Soskis puffs on his pipe thoughtfully, then takes a brown folder out of his desk drawer. He spots the Metropolitan Police stamp on the top right-hand corner. His blood runs cold. Is this the very file he's been discussing? The one containing Norman's letters? It hadn't crossed his mind Soskis would seek it out. Soskis lays a hand on top of it. Thorpe feels nauseous as he thinks back to the things he wrote. They make a mockery of all he's just said. Frank, let me just say... But Soskis holds a hand up to stop him. Thorpe's heart sinks further. The man must be so appalled, he won't even discuss it. All he can do is wait, like a lamb to the slaughter. In my view, law reform on this matter is long overdue. 
I'm personally in favour of legalising homosexuality between consenting adults. Thorpe is stunned. He had no idea Soskis was so progressive. The Home Secretary stays on him, a knowing look in his eyes. Not that this applies to you. As you say, the boy is obviously a fantasist. Stay away from the creature. If he makes any more demands, get rid of him. Treat him rough. That's not just saying stay out of his way. It sounds like a bit more than that. I mean, this is just an example of the establishment closing ranks. Yes, and it's terrifying because if you're Norman or anyone else who has an issue with the establishment or you're just seeking basic justice, the system is completely rigged against you. Thorpe's relief is palpable. His dream would be to have the file destroyed, but he daren't push his luck. Stepping out of the Home Office building, he takes a moment to bask in the winter sunshine. An hour ago, he was facing the end of his political career. Now, he's been given a second chance. He's not going to waste it. It's time to regroup and focus on his leadership bid. With Norman's threat extinguished and a skilled gatekeeper like Bessel by his side, there's no reason why he can't climb all the way to the top. Two years later, the 15th of January, 1967, Westminster. In the members' bar, Bessel pops the cork on a bottle of champagne, pours himself and Thorpe a glass. To, dare I say, our new leader. There's a familiar twinkle in Thorpe's eye as he clinks Bessel's glass. An hour ago, Joe Grimmond finally announced his decision to retire as Liberal leader, and Thorpe is all but guaranteed to replace him. This is the moment they've both been waiting for. Over the past two years, Bessel has become Thorpe's closest friend and confidant in all political and personal matters. In return for his loyalty, Thorpe has elevated his standing in the party and even given him access to its funds to cover some bad investments he's made. OK, that sounds like direct corruption. At least in contemporary politics, people hide that by doling out contracts through sort of shell companies and things. They don't just go, and the vault's there, just duck tells it. With Thorpe safely installed in the top job, Bessel's confident that will continue. They're soon joined at the bar by a legion of Thorpe supporters, but Bessel frowns at the sight of Emlyn Hewson, the MP for Conway in Wales, pushing through the scrum. He knows the man harbours leadership ambitions of his own. Jeremy, I trust you'll be throwing your hat in the ring for leadership. If that's what the party demands, it would be churlish to resist the will of our members, don't you think? Houston grins widely. Bessel feels uneasy. A politician only looks that smug when they know something their rival doesn't. In that case, aren't you worried about the little matter of the man in Dublin? Bessel struggles to hide his alarm. To his surprise, Thorpe seems perfectly calm. I have no idea what you're talking about, Emlyn. Thorpe might seem calm, but Bessel knows inside he's raging. The leadership vote will happen in a few days. If this rumour isn't nipped in the bud fast, Bessel has no doubt it will wreck Thorpe's chances. As if reading his mind, Hooson goes on. There are many party members who will never vote in a suspected homosexual as their leader. We're not all fooled by your bachelor lifestyle, Jeremy. Bessel eyes the MPs nearby. Some of them laugh and pat Thorpe's shoulder in support, but others are reticent. Once they're alone, Thorpe's calm exterior disappears. He turns to Bessel, his face like thunder. What the hell? Leave it with me, Jeremy. I'm here to do the worrying for you. As Thorpe leaves, Bessel realises he has to act fast. He doesn't have time to shut down the rumours about Norman completely, but he knows that any piece of slander can be spun, and he thinks he has just the right angle. Bessel's eyes dart around the room, resting on the MP for Ross and Cromarty, Alistair Mackenzie. He's one of the Liberal Party's most incorrigible gossips. Bessel smiles to himself. He intends to take advantage of that. The next day, Bessel is in his Pall Mall office when Thorpe bursts in, grinning from ear to ear. 
I don't know what you did, but my phone's been ringing all morning. I've been all but assured that I'll win the leadership. Bessel smiles, then reveals he had dinner with Mackenzie last night and spun him the real story about why Thorpe is a confirmed bachelor. I told him you're desperately in love with a woman, but alas, she's married to someone else. Such is the depth of your unrequited love. No one else can compare. To ensure he wouldn't probe more deeply, I told him the woman in question is my wife. It's such a juicy bit of gossip, he's clearly talked of nothing else since. The man in Dublin is yesterday's news. It's seen as nothing more than a smear campaign by one of your competitors for the leadership. OK, there's a lot to unpack there. So, one MP has spread a rumour that his mate is in love with his wife. Yep. And that has helped his leadership bid. What I love is that if you've got some gossip to bury, the bit of gossip that has to cover that up has to be big enough to overshadow it. So what do you do? You go for your own family. Thorpe looks momentarily stunned. Then he beams, grabs Bessel by the shoulders. You're a genius, Vaselli. We'll shake this old party up, my friend. I'll lead as ruthlessly as Lloyd George. No more farting about. Now it's a crusade. Remind me to give you a peerage once I'm PM. Bessel is suitably stirred. Cash would be more useful, but he won't rain on Thorpe's parade by mentioning that now. He's come to his friend's rescue once again. Bessel's confident that when he needs him to, Thorpe will return the favour. September 1967, Westminster. In his office, Thorpe checks himself in the mirror as he tries on a new dinner jacket. He's so impressed by how it looks, he doesn't even notice Bessel entering the room. Whoever you're dressing up for, I'm afraid you'll have to keep relations strictly above the waist, at least until the antibiotics do their job. Bessel hands Thorpe a paper bag, from which he lifts a bottle of pills, prescribed to clear up a bout of gonorrhea. Thanks, Baselli. I promise this is the last time I'll be so careless. If I'm going to keep seeing Caroline, I don't want to give her a dose of the clab. Thorpe had met Caroline a month earlier while holidaying in Corfu, the same holiday where Thorpe contracted his STD after having sex with a male waiter on the beach. An irony that clearly isn't lost on Bessel, who starts chuckling. You're not going to let it go that far, surely. A girl on your arm for the cameras is one thing, but sex? How would you even get it up? I suppose if I closed my eyes and gritted my teeth, I'd manage. You wouldn't want to see that. (laughs) (laughs) You sure you're enjoying this? Yes, this is my happy face. Bessel laughs even harder. Thorpe darkens. Bessel's been much more cocksure these past few months, ever since Thorpe got elected party leader. Sometimes he wishes Bessel didn't know quite so much. But deep down, he knows his friend is right to mock. He has no real romantic designs on Caroline after all. She's merely a convenient cover. Thorpe doesn't want any more talk of sexuality compromising his leadership. He's curt when he addresses Bessel again. I'm a bit busy, Peter. What can I do for you? Bessel shuffles, his bravado replaced by an awkwardness. Right, yes. Business isn't going well. I wondered if you could, um, see your way to helping again. Thorpe sighs. He's had this conversation too many times. He throws Bessel a withering look, but Bessel goes on. It's different this time. I'm looking at bankruptcy. You know the implications of that. Thorpe does. Bessel would immediately have to resign his seat in Parliament. He goes on to tell Thorpe that without an immediate injection of funds, the only way to avoid losing everything would be to move to the USA for the foreseeable future. Thorpe is aghast. While he's sometimes irritated by Bessel, he's still hugely reliant on the man. Bessel doesn't just run his errands. He keeps Norman in check, keeps Thorpe's enemies at bay. But now he's party leader, his every action is scrutinised. Giving Bessel more party funds is too big a risk. Thorpe takes a moment, then eyes him gravely. I'm sorry, Peter. I can't help you. I have too much to lose. Brutal. Bessel visibly pales. He looks utterly betrayed. 
but after a moment, he nods. Of course. Without another word, Bessel leaves. Thorpe slumps back in his chair. He eyes the antibiotics, a stark reminder of how much he's relied on Bessel. Without him, Thorpe needs more than the odd cover story. He needs a proper insurance policy. Which reminds me, I must get that national insurance card for lovely Norman. (laughs) That evening, at the revolving restaurant at the top of the post office tower, Thorpe points out the magnificent view of London to his date, Caroline. Thorpe pushes one of Caroline's soft brown curls behind her ear, looks lovingly into her eyes. I know our romance has been somewhat brief, but that does not reflect the depth of my feelings. In fact, I simply can't imagine my life without you. Caroline looks surprised, but she smiles. Thorpe takes a ring box from his pocket. You've got to be kidding. They've only been going out a month. A month. Caroline Allpass, would you do me the great honour of becoming my wife? Caroline looks stunned. She doesn't answer for what feels like an eternity. Beads of sweat prick Thorpe's brow. Has he misread her? Come on too strong? Finally, she speaks. Oh yes, Jeremy, of course I will. Thorpe places the ring on Caroline's finger, kisses her. She takes in the large diamond, clearly overjoyed. Thorpe feels a surge of relief. Caroline is fun. They share friends and interests. She's his perfect match, really. And kissing her hasn't been so bad. He's sure he can find a way to manage the rest. If Bessel isn't going to be around to protect him, taking a wife will make it much harder for the likes of Hooson to unseat Thorpe with vicious rumours. He can build a life befitting a Prime Minister-in-waiting. His future will be assured. Fifteen months later, November 1969, Dorset. The sun sets behind Norman as he cuts through the metal padlock and yanks open the door of a shed at the local allotments. He frantically shines his flashlight around. He makes out garden equipment, some furniture, but no sack of potatoes or any other similar harvest of food. His heart sinks. With no sheds left to try, he'll have to return to his pregnant wife empty-handed yet again. A year ago, life looked so different. Norman was finally on the up. He reinvented himself as Norman Scott and started a new modelling career. Returning to the UK, he'd thrown himself into swinging London life, going to parties attended by guests like Mick Jagger. He even had a one-night stand with artist Francis Bacon. Then he met art restorer Sue Myers and they fell in love. They married five months ago. Norman Scott's life was a world away from Norman Joseph's. Hasn't he done the name swap the wrong way round? Like, Norman Scott sounds like a normal name. Norman Joseph sounds like a showbiz name. What would your showbiz name be? Not that Matt Ford isn't a really shiny, glamorous name. I think Matt Ford's probably the least showbiz. Just like two-syllable Matt Ford. (laughs) It's the dullest name in showbiz. It sounds a bit like a name you'd make up if you were stopped by the police and you were like, I don't want to give them my real name. They'd be like, what's your name? You'd be like, Matt Ford? Mick Smith. (laughs) Paul Jones. It's like it's the shortest amount of noise you can get out of your mouth, isn't it, Matt Vod? I'd go for something really big and long, I think, like Matt Von Santander or something like that. I love it still, Matt. <laughs> oh, you've got to keep the Matt bit, haven't you? <laughs> haven't you? I'd go for something really lavish, like Matt, still. <laughs> <laughs> then things began to fall apart. Along with Norman's more lavish and glamorous lifestyle came a growing dependence on drink and drugs, and the modelling jobs dried up. With dwindling funds, he and Sue were forced to move from London to Dorset, where a friend offered them shelter in her holiday cottage. Returning there now, he steals himself for an argument. Instead, he finds a note. Tears prick Norman's eyes as he reads it. Norman, I've gone back to my mum and dad's. I just don't believe you can provide for me, let alone our unborn child. Norman rushes into their bedroom, every last possession of hers, is gone. Norman's eyes travel to the sleeping pills on the nightstand. It would be so easy to fall back into his old habits, block out the pain. But if he tries to end it all, he'll never get to meet their baby. 
He has to try and win Sue back, and he can only think of one way to do it. He was determined to live his life without handouts from Thorpe. But he never received his national insurance card. You're kidding me. The trouble is, Peter Bessel now lives in New York, and Norman only has an address for him there, no number. He'll have to go to Thorpe Direct. 20 minutes later, Norman is standing in a telephone box. He looks up Thorpe's home number in the directory, then dials the operator. His heart thuds in his chest as he listens to the phone ring. But when a voice comes on the line, it's not Jeremy. Hello, Caroline Thorpe speaking. Norman's confused. Thorpe has two sisters, but he knows neither are named Caroline. He stutters his response. Uh, is, uh, Jeremy Thorpe there? I'm sorry, my husband's out right now. Can I take a message? Norman's head spins. Then he hears a baby crying in the background. It's like a punch to the gut. Caroline's voice cuts through his thoughts. Hello? Norman hesitates, unsure what to do. Caroline is innocent. He doesn't want to hurt her. But he can't shake the growing anger he feels. Why should he lose everything yet again, while Thorpe gets to live happily ever after? My name is Norman Scott. I'm afraid what I'm about to tell you may come as a shock. Myself and your husband, Jeremy, used to be lovers. This isn't about money anymore. It's about payback. If Norman must lose his family, he's going to make damn sure Thorpe does too. Eight months later, 28th of June, 1970, North Devon. In the hallway, Thorpe searches for his favourite bowler hat. Caroline walks towards him, holding it out. Looking for this? What would I do without you, darling? You'd have a very cold head. Thorpe kisses her on the forehead. This marriage has given him a contentment he never thought possible. Certainly, it began as a show. Thorpe invited over 800 guests to their wedding reception at the Royal Academy, including the Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. But since then, he's found real joy in family life, only strengthened when they had their son Rupert 15 months ago. He takes her in. She's smiling, but there's a faraway look in her eyes. Thorpe's heart immediately sinks. He knows the reason. That blasted phone call from Norman. Caroline said she didn't believe his claims, but she hasn't been the same since. She constantly complains of nightmares, and he often finds her staring into space, in a strange, trance-like state, like now. He's tried to spend more time at home, reassuring her, but he can't put work on the back burner any longer. He pulls her close. I wish I didn't have to go back to blasted Westminster. I'll be back as soon as I can. Why don't you get my mother to take Rupee today? Get out of here. Take a drive. Go off somewhere for tea. The fresh air will do you good. Caroline nods, and Thorpe reluctantly goes on his way. As he drives, his mind turns to the problems he's heading towards in London. In the recent general election, won by the Tories, Thorpe clung on to his seat by just 369 votes. The Liberals underperformed across the board. He's heard murmurs of dissent about him staying on as leader, he needs to show his face more, convince the party he can lead them back to glory. His political future depends on it. But after driving for an hour, Thorpe's thoughts drift back to Caroline. Norman's been AWOL since that call. Thorpe can't track him down. Is he biding his time, waiting to strike again? Could he be at the house now, talking to Caroline, convincing her? Thorpe slams on the brakes, turns the car around, he can't risk Caroline's doubts growing, her love lessening. She must take precedence over the party right now. He'll go home, lavish her with attention, let his critics do their worst. And when the time is right, he'll win back their support, like he always does. Pulling into his driveway an hour later, Thorpe is thrown to see a police car waiting. His first thought is Norman. 
As he parks up beside it, two uniformed officers get out. Thorpe studies them for a beat. There's something off about the way they're looking at him. Not with judgment or suspicion, but with pity. With a sense of foreboding, he gets out of his car. Mr Thorpe, could we go inside? Please. Thorpe leads them into the hallway, where he kissed Caroline goodbye only hours earlier. For some reason, he can't go any further. He turns and waits. The officers glance at each other sheepishly. Finally, one of them speaks. I'm afraid your wife was involved in a road traffic accident this afternoon. Her car collided with a 13-ton lorry. She had to be taken to hospital. Thorpe's mouth goes bone dry. His throat tightens. He knows what the officer is going to say next, but the words still feel like an electric shock when they come. Unfortunately, it was too late. She died, Mr Thorpe. Thorpe puts a hand on the wall to steady himself. The officer carries on talking, filling in the details, but Thorpe can't hear what he's saying. His whole world has ended. December 1970, North Devon. Thorpe sits in the back of the taxi, willing his mother to stop talking. It's the day of Caroline's inquest, and he's not sure how he's going to get through it. The last thing he needs right now is one of Ursula's pep talks. He turns away from her, stares out of the window. She doesn't take the hint. You must get back into a routine. Give your constituents your attention. Caroline was your biggest cheerleader. She wouldn't want you moping forever. Deep down, Thorpe knows she's right, but he hasn't been able to work up any enthusiasm for his job since Caroline's death. He snaps back. If anything, she'd be disappointed by such lazy clichés, mother. But as they reach the coroner's court, Thorpe is overwhelmed by the support on show. Well-wishers line the length of the street. They flock round him, offering prayers and words of comfort. In the old days, he probably would have capitalised on their sympathy, used it to build back his stature within the party. Now he feels nothing but gratitude. He realises his own mother is right. These people see the man Caroline saw, the best of him. He vows to stop wallowing, devote himself to their needs. He just has to get through the next few hours. Maybe then he'll feel some sense of closure and be able to move on. Taking his seat in the courtroom, he's touched once again, this time by the sight of Peter Bessel. He must have flown over from New York, specially. Thorpe makes a mental note to seek him out when this is all over. Then he forces himself to listen to the accounts of what happened to Caroline that day. How her car somersaulted 12 feet into the air. How she suffered multiple traumatic injuries. There are no surprises. All the evidence adds up to what he already knew, that this was simply a tragic, blameless accident. That is, until the driver of the lorry Caroline collided with gives testimony. I pushed down on the horn, but she kept driving towards me. She was looking straight ahead like she was daydreaming or in some kind of trance. That word trance cuts through Thorpe like a knife. He suddenly feels off balance like the room is tipped upside down. He'd always assumed Caroline had been spooked by something on the road or momentarily lost concentration. But she'd been in a trance, the same trance he'd witnessed so many times since that call. Thorpe feels wave upon wave of anger overwhelm him. This is all Norman's fault. When the inquest ends, Thorpe rushes over to Bessel. He pulls him into the first empty room he can find. Peter, I know we haven't been as close this last year, but you're the person I trust the most in the world. I need to know I can count on you now, that I have your unequivocal support. Of course, Jeremy, always. Thorpe hesitates. Can he really share this thought with anyone, even Bessel? Studying his face, Thorpe knows all he can do is trust his gut. And his gut says his old friend is as loyal as ever. 
There's only one person who's to blame for this, and I won't rest until justice is done. We're going to do what we should have done years ago. We're going to kill Norman Scott. This is the second episode in our series, The Murderous MP. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read A Very English Scandal by John Preston, An Accidental Icon by Norman Scott, Brinkgate, The Rise and Fall of Jeremy Thorpe by Barry Penrose, and In My Own Time by Jeremy Thorpe. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. Wendy Granditor wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louie for Wondering.